All right, uh, let's uh, begin our second session. The first speaker is Yu Hong Fan. Uh, please have a seat. Okay, um, so I'll be uh, just presenting some of our work on um, modeling magnetic flux emergence in the solar convective envelope responsible for the formation of solar active regions. I'll compare results from a simplified uh, one-dimensional thin flux tube model, which assumed that the uh, active region flux originate from the point wise of flux tubes from the bottom of the convection zone, and also compare with results of uh, global scale convective dynamo simulations where the emerging flux is formed in the bulk of the convection zone. So here, listed here are my collaborators um, whose work have contributed to the materials I presented here. So one widely considered scenario for the formation of solar active regions is that a deep seated solar cycle dynamo generate a strong toroidal magnetic field um, near the bottom of the convection zone stored in the overshoot region, and then um, magnetic buoyancy stability develops, and then buoyant flux tubes form omega-shaped loops that rises through the convection zone to the surface to form the observed solar active regions. Um, so in such a picture, the, uh, the emerging flux loops should satisfy the observed, be consistent with the observed properties of solar active regions, uh, which is well known, the, the Joyce law of active region tilt, which um, it shows that the active region's leading polarity is tilted towards the equator comparing the following polarity um, by a small angle. And also there are these um, observed asymmetric morphology of solar active regions where the leading polarities tend to have a more coherent appearance in, in the form of large sunspots, whereas the following polarities are more fragmented. So the emerging flux should be consistent with these um, observed properties of solar active regions. So consider active region scale flux tubes in the bottom of the convection zone. Um, given the range of magnetic flux for active regions, ranging from 10 to 20 to 10 to 22 Maxwell, and as, uh, given the range of fe possible field strength, assuming that the field strength is at least in equal partition with convection in the deep convection zone, then you get a range of uh, size scale radius of the tube, and which, is, which are for these active region scale tubes are thin compared to the local pressure scale height. And also they are um, cannot be well resolved by the typical grid resolutions in um, typical 3D global scale MHD simulations, which has a resolution of this scale. So the magnetic buoyancy instability of these small, of these kind of active region scale tubes cannot be very well represented in these three-dimensional simulations. So previously, uh, a highly simplified one-dimensional thin flux tube model um, that derived from has been derived from MHD equations, which describe the uh, uh, Lagrangian evolution of these, the mean properties, the motion, the loss of magnetic field, density, pressure, temperature of individual tube segments along this one-dimensional flux tube. Um, all quantities are assumed to be uh, averages across the tube cross-section, and they only vary along the tube arc length and, uh, the, and time, so it's a 1D model. So shown here are the set of uh, thin flux tube equations, which describe the Lagrangian evolution of the motion, magnetic field, density, pressure, and temperature of, this, um, of each tube segment along the tube, uh, moving in the convection zone, in the external convection zone model of pressure, density, temperature, and also an external flow field, um, where the density and pressure are assumed to be, for the external convection zone, are assumed to be in um, Used to, uh, we use a solar model, and which is assumed to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. And here is the mo equation of motion that describes the motion of uh, individual tube elements, which subject to the integrated forces acting on the, these uh, tube segments, which include the Coriolis force, the buoyancy force, um, pressure gradient along the tube, and the magnetic tension. And here is a um, hydrodynamic drag force through which this, um, the external time-dependent velocity field impact uh, of convection and the mean flow impact the, uh, the motion of the tube. We here, you for this external velocity field, we have used a, uh, the uh, separately computed global convection simulation by ASH, which produced uh, the giant cell convection and also a solar-like differential rotation, as shown here. And uh, so from a simple order uh, of magnitude estimate, in order for the magnetic buoyancy force to dominate the hydrodynamic force 
from convection, the drag force from convection, um, you, we estimate for the uh, active fusion scale flux tubes at the base of the convection zone, the magnetic field strength needs to be at least about three times the equal partition field strength, given the size scale of the flux tubes. And this gives a, a field strength of about 20 kilogauss for the magnetic buoyancy to dominate. And shown here um, is an earlier simulation where we considered initial toroidal flux rings in mechanical equilibrium at the base of the convection zone uh, with field strength ranging from this 1, 1.5 times 10 to the 4 gauss to 10 to the 5 gauss. Latitude ranges from um, 1 to 40 degrees in both hemispheres and, um, and total magnetic flux of this value. And we, can, we model the evolution of these toroidal flux, initial toroidal flux ring in mechanical equilibrium. And they are found to develop the magnetic buoyancy instabilities, which lead to the formation of these emerging loops of M equals 1 and 2 modes, mostly, um, that rises to the surface. And it's found that, consistent with the previous simple estimate, that uh, for tubes with field strength below about 20 kilogauss, the, uh, the emerging loops shapes are significantly distorted by the convection. Whereas for the stronger fields of about 100 kilogauss, you can see that mostly on the, uh, the distortions mostly due to the strong downflows, which dominate the, the uh, magnetic buoyancy. So recently, we have carried out more thin flux tube simulations of rising flux, flux tubes originating from um, to, uh, e initial equilibrium toroidal flux tubes stored in the stable overshoot region. We start off with these initial toroidal flux tubes in neutral buoyancy in mechanical equilibrium, but with the a, with a undulation um, present so that the top part of this apex of this toroidal tube, as uh, outlined by the, the red curve, has approached the bottom of the convection zone. And radiative diffusion, uh, radiative heating, had caused the flux tube to drift upwards quasi-statically through the stable layer and with the apex of the, this tube, first entering the unstably stratified convection zone, which then become, will become, this section will become buoyantly unstable and form this kind of uh, uh, emerging loops, which um, rises in the convection zone impacted by the, uh, the convective flows, external convective flows fields, which is computed from ash. And, uh, and then um, we consider the range of initial field strength from 30 kilogauss to 100 kilogauss and range of latitude. And we also try to sample different parts of the convective flow to build up the statistics uh, by having the uh, apex at the different azimuthal longitude angles, and also by sampling different time spans of the convection to uh, study the, the, the perturbation due to convection. And from this thin flux tube model, we find that these rising tubes, or rising from the overshoot layer, has pretty uniform rise time, um, ranging from 45 to 60 days. Um, in the range of field strength and latitude range we considered. And also, the, uh, they all show a tendon systematic shift, um, poleward deflection of the emerging latitude compared to the initial latitude, um, where with the, because of the Coriolis force acting on the rising tube, with the uh, smaller field strength, weaker field strength cases showing slightly more systematically um, the poleward shift. So in these kind of models, the, uh, the tilt angle of active regions, the east, these emerging loops develop, at the apex develop a slight tilt due to the Coriolis force acting on the, uh, the stretching, diverging motion at apex of, this, of the loops. Um, and we've, here we show the, uh, for these simulations, the, the mean tilt and also their RMS scatter as a function of latitude for various different field strengths and fitted with a, a linear form here uh, of depend upon sign of latitude, as shown by the dash dotted line, compared with these observations of tilt angles, uh, whereas these two cases, the top and bottom, are based on uh, Mount Wilson sunspot group tilt measurements, and the middle one is based on MDI magnetograms. And this one is the most recent study of the Mount Wilson sunspot group data covering a, a solar cycle from cycle 15 to 24. And here are the fitted slopes given by these studies. And we can see typically that the, the tilt at mean tilt angle, the slope is greater for the magnetogram measurements, significantly bigger compared to the sunspot group measurement. And the reason here, the, the 
here superimposed. This is the dash line is the, the fitted slope from sunspot group data, and then this um, dotted line here is the, uh, the the result from magnetogram here. And you can see that it is significantly different. But um, one of the main results that found in the recent study is that these tilt angles are not uh, simply linearly dependent upon the sign of latitude, but shows a saturation at about uh, 20 to 30 degrees. So comparing to the simulation result, thin flux tube simulation result, we see that the, uh, the, the fitted tilt slope is uh, best match the observation of better match the observed sunspot group results in terms of amplitude. And also the, uh, we also see the, there is a, there's this trend of saturation of mean tilt with latitude, which maximize at about 20 to 30 degrees also present. Oops. And it appears that for the case with the field strength of 60 kilogauss, the, both the mean tilt and R mass scatter fit the observation the best, whereas the field, stronger field tend to show too small mean tilt and scatter, whereas the 30 kilogauss case, the scatter is too large compared to sunspot group tilt RMS scatter. And also, one, another asymmetry that's formed, developed in these emerging flux loops is that the tendency for the leading side of the emerging loop to have a stronger field compared to the falling side, as shown in this uh, gradient of B over the apex along the loop, going from the following to the leading side. And you see that these gradients are systematically positive, meaning the field is increasing going over the apex compared to um, the leading and the following. Uh, for, field, for loops with initial field strength, about 60 kilogauss or weaker. And as shown here in the example, the leading field strength is systematically stronger than the following leg of the loop for, at all depths. And this we, uh, was argued previously to be a cause, possible cause for the origin of the asymmetric morphology of active regions where the leading sunspot tend to be more coherent because of the leading leg of the loop is uh, stronger. And, but one of the main difficulties associated with these thin flux tube model rising all the way from the bottom of the convection zone is that the apex of these emerging loops all show systematically retrograde motion relative to solid body rotation, which means that they will move uh, relative retrograde compared to the plasma mean zonal velocity at, the, at, the, at low latitudes. And this is inconsistent with the observation of sunspots, which tend to uh, have shown to, to rotate faster systematically compared to the mean rotation rate of the plasma. So in recent years, we have also carried out uh, global scale 3D MHD convective dynamo simulations um, of the solar convective envelope driven by the radiative diffusive heat flux using uh, a finite difference spherical inelastic code in a partial spherical shell domain that extends from the bottom of the convection zone to about 0.97 solar radius and a latitude range of plus minus 60 degrees and uh, two pi azimuth range. And in the, the resolution of these simulations have a horizontal resolution about um, 2.8 to 5.5 megameters, which cannot resolve adequately the, uh, the, the previously considered activity scale, activity scale flux tubes. Um, these convective dynamo simulations have, were able to produce um, cyclic, irregular cyclic mean field um, that have irregular polarity reversals and self-consistently maintain a solar-like differential rotation consistent uh, with the observed solar um, mean rotation, differential rotation profile. And the, the peak azimuthally average mean field strength produced by these models only reach about 7,000 Gauss at the base, which is concentrated at the base of the convection zone. But there are filamentary field concentrations of order of 30 kilogauss being produced, which, which is uh, super equal partition compared to the RMS velocity of convection in the, in the deep convection zone. And in the midst of these, the turbulent field, we found occasional formation of coherent um, toroidal magnetic flux bundles that emerge towards the surface, um, as shown in these, by the field lines here, and also show by these isosurfaces of um, regions which outline regions of field strength e exceeding the local equipartition field strength based on the uh, RMS velocity of convection at that height. And we see that these strong emerging, I mean, these emerging horizontal flux bundles are not um, rising all the way from the bottom of the convection, but are rather very strongly coupled to 
the giant cell convective flow patterns. And they are moving prograde in the low latitude region. Um, com well, they, they move retrograde in the high latitude region. And their the rise velocity uh, in these emerging regions do, do, do not seem to be much different from the typical giant cell convective upflow. So we have done some statistical study of these um, super equal partition field strength emerging pixels at this height. And we found that they, the field in these pixels um, conform to Hale's polarity rule by only by three, uh, by 2.4 to 1 in area, which is much less than the uh, how active region uh, conform to Hale's rule, which is about 90%. And they, the, the, as the, mu the, sorry, the horizontal field um, shows a systematic mean tilt, uh, which is about 7.5 degrees, which is consistent with the uh, the mean tilt of solar active regions, but, has show, but shows a much larger scatter. It has a very um, weak trend of Joyce law with mean tilt increasing with latitude, but barely is st it's barely statistically significant given the large scatter. And we found that, that these uh, strong field, super equation field, re horizontal field regions tend to um, move prograde relative to the local mean zonal velocity in the low latitude region and preferentially retrograde in the high latitude region. And we also find that these um, strong um, flux bundles in the convection zone, convection envelope, tend to develop this kind of forward leaning shape towards directional rotation um, in the low latitude region at constant latitude slice, R5 slices shown here, uh, where the, the color indicates the uh, azimuthal field strength and the, the arrows show the convective velocity in the slice. So you see they, they develop these kind of forward leaning shape, uh, which is basically due to this uh, positive correlation of radial and phi velocities, where the auto, where, which actually transport angular momentum outward as well. And its um, outward motion tend to be correlated with prograde motion. And we see here two examples of uh, two strong emerging flux bundles which develop this kind of forward leaning shape of loop with the leading side being pushed closer to the downflow lanes compared to the following side, one in the north and the south. So to understand, to, to study possible consequences of such asymmetric emerging flux bundles on active region formation, um, we have extracted the, both the velocity and magnetic fields centered on the, one of the strong emerging flux, flux bundles in the northern hemisphere and extract the B and V field as shown here um, at a depth of 30 megameters, tracking this central rotation, central emerging region. And the, we, f we track this at the rate of about um, 50 meters faster than the, the zonal mean rotation rate. And I also noticed notice that here there is another strongly emerging horizontal field in the southern hemisphere here of opposite directed field. In this, track, in, in this extracted region. And we use this um, B and V field to drive a near surface layer uh, flux emergence simulation to see what kind of activation can form. So Chen Fengchen and Matthias Rempel have used, have carried out um, near surface layer radiation image simulations of active region formation uh, driven at the low boundary by the uh, extracted Dynam from dynamo simulation, the B and uh, V fields. And uh, the simulation, these near surface layer simulations, compressible and uh, include radio transfer, um, has, w were done in several domain sizes with a domain depth range from 8 to 32 megameters and horizontal size scale of 98 to 196 megameters, which is substantially smaller than the extracted size scale of the, act of the region from the dynamo simulation. So substantial rescaling in the horizontal size and vertical velocity as well as in time have been carried out. But nevertheless, the, uh, the relative spatial variation of the magnetic field in relation to the, and the velocity field uh, are being preserved in, the, in, the, in these simulations. So shown here is an example, Muran MHD simulation. Um, carried out by Feng Chen. And we shown here at the bottom two panels are the horizontal field and the 
velocity field. The top is the nanograms and the um, wildlife continuum. You see the first southern um, horizontal flux bundle emerges, and it leads to the formation of the lower sunspot pair, with the leading polarity sunspot forms first, because it's pro proximity to the downflow lane. And then the central emerging flux rises, and then it forms another sunspot pair of opposite directed polarity, and also the leading polarity sunspot forms first. Um, we f it is found that in both cases that the leading spots are more coherent, and also they, they tend to track the, uh, the downflow lanes at the uh, bottom boundary imposed velocity field. So here are vertical slices through the center of the central emerging region uh, through this uh, near surface layer simulation. And you can see that this both forward leaning shape of the emerging loop and the prograde flow have been carried into also this near surface layer simulation. And with the leading side being pushed closer to the downflow lane. And as a result, um, the leading side of the uh, emerging loop experiences a stronger amplification of its vertical field due to both compression, converging flow, as well as due to uh, a shear, uh, vertical shear by the downflow lanes. And both result in the formation of a, uh, early formation of a monolithic strong, tor strong vertical flux tube under underlying the sunspot all the way to the bottom. It is also found that this result of asymmetric formation of act regions are robust given different, for all the different domain sizes studied, carried out with the deepest domain case showing the most pronounced asymmetry between the, the leading and following polarity of the sunspot pairs. So in summary, we um, found from these simulations of uh, active region formation, rising flux tubes in the solar convection zone, we found from first from thin flux tube simulations, which assume that the flux tube rise from the bottom of the convection zone to the surface, um, it can produce the observed mean tilt and its latitudinal dependence, the Joyce law, as well as the, uh, the scatter in the tilt of, for the sunspot groups with the best result from tubes with the initial field strength of about 60 kilogauss. And these simulations result can explain the observed morphological asymmetry of active regions by the, the field strength asymmetry that develops in these loops. But the main difficulties with these models is that the retrograde motion that exhibit at the apex of the emerging loops is, is difficult to reconcile with the observations of sunspot groups. On the other hand, um, emerging super flux bundles generated from convective dynamo simulations um, found these emerging regions, emerging flux, strongly coupled with giant cell convection and tend to move prograde relative to the zonal flow. And they develop this kind of a forward leaning loop shape with the leading side being closer to the downflow lanes of the giant cell. And that can lead, also lead to the asymmetric morphology of an actor region, giving a different kinds of explanation. Um, so future work is that I think that uh, large-scale convective dynamo simulation needs to improve its uh, numerical, reduce numerical diffusion and to reach stronger field strength that's closer to the, uh, so reduce the scatter in the tilt and also um, to explore more active gene scale field strength with um, magnetic buoyancy dominating. Okay, thank you. of the system here. Uh, so uh, it, it's very interesting. Like you, you, um, your results suggest that the convection is very important for the, um, the rise of magnetic flux um, in the convection zone and some of the emergent properties. And uh, you know, as, as you are aware, I'm sure there's this big question of what are the convective amplitudes in the deep convection zone and um, what, what is the structure of the convection. Um, and what you're doing is you, you've got a model with convection and you're comparing the, the emergent properties of the flux to actual observations. I'm wondering if you could run that backwards at all um, and somehow use the, uh, the properties of the, the magnetic field that we observe on the surface of the sun in tandem with your, your models to actually say something about the interior convection 
And I just wonder if you've thought of that at all. Yeah, I mean, the, the convective amplitude, you're saying that, well, in these simulations, as we know, that the, the convective amplitude is pretty large, you know, um, that inconsistent with TV seismology measurement, for example. And I'm, I haven't, uh, I don't really have any idea how to address that question, but I, it seems from these, the simulations that using the dynamo emerging flux to drive the near surface layer simulation carried out by Fung and Matthias, um, it seems that it's suggesting that the, uh, the, the sunspot formation process really is tracking where the, the downflow lanes are of the giant cells. And that is also possibly consistent with observations of sunspots being, have a nearly the rotation rate of the, at the, the bottom of the near surface shear layer. At the, the rate that's faster, but it's almost the same as, as the, uh, the, the near surface shear layer that, you know, at the 9.9 five solar radius. So that means that maybe the giant cell, even if we cannot observe, I, I don't know if it's there or not, but I, I think they, are, they could be controlling the activation scales as well as um, the, the, uh, the formation process. It, it seems to be tracking the, that. And then the asymmetries is because how, they are, how the distribution of the emerging flux relative to the, the, the cell, the, the, the boundary of the downflow lane. So when you showed these, uh, maybe you showed one very early on in your, your talk. I thought I saw one today somewhere. Um, but these big active region complexes on the sun, do you think that's sort of giving some sense of the, the giant cell structure? Or it's more indic indicative of where the downflow lanes are? Yeah, that's, I think, yeah, that, that seems to be suggested from these couple of simulations, that active regions are I don't know, this is an outrageous statement, but, uh, but it's not, a, I mean, it, it just seems to be controlled by these downflow lanes, that where the sunspots form, it's tracking it. Actually, Feng did a simulation, he said that, that you know, I imposed this flow field which extracts from dynamo, and then if you turn it off, the sunspots just um, start to fragment. So, so imposing this downflows with this pattern is actually really, you know, ho holding, forming the sun. I mean, what, Matthias, you can comment on that, too. So. Uh, have you been looking into helicity evolution? Did you find something what people observed the wrong helicities in, in either hemisphere? Or is, hemis uh, is helicity in nothing you were interested in? Yeah, the, well, I haven't looked. I mean, there is also this whole study of the, uh, you know, yeah, there is a hemispheric helicity of you know, at region tilt, the twist. One possible origin of it could be generated in the dynamo already, but these um, simulations, I mean, there is a mean kinetic, sorry, mean current helicity in the mean field um, that is consistent with the, uh, with the observed. But I haven't looked at the, the emerging field specifically, but there is a current helicity in the mean field that's been did you did you observe exceptions from this uh, um, usual helicity or in the simulation? I haven't really looked at the emerging flux of the the, the twist, in, in, you know, in current helicity in the emerging flux compared to the observations. But another possible f way that the helicity mean the, the active region helicity can be generated is that the uh, as the if it's untwisted to begin with the field, then when the emerging loop right emerges, they 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 develop a tilt. And that tilt basically produces a rise of the tube. And then internally, to conserve helicity, total helicity, that it will produce a twist inside. And that twist would be consistent with the observed uh, active region current helicity, the hemispheric preference. <coughs> I have a comment. Um, recently, we used um, uh, observe, observed oscillation in solar activity, like five months, Rieger periodicity, and uh, theoretical dispersion relation of uh, magneto Rossby waves in dynamo layer. And uh, we estimated the magnetic field strength. And apparently, it's around 40 to 50 kilogauss. So it's uh, quite near to your estimation of uh, thin flux. Yeah, from thin tube dynamics. 
Yeah, the only problem with the thin flux tube model, right, for, for a flux tube rising all the way from the bottom to the surface is that retrograde motion. Don't know how to reconcile it with the observed sunspot motion. It's, in the, it's interesting to think the difference between stars and accretion disks with respect to rising flux tubes, the different uh, boundary. For example, in the accretion disk, you have a shear flow where the foot points are strongly sheared. I don't, I, it would be interesting to, to have similar simulations in that context as well. Uh, what happens, for example, if the foot points of your flux tubes were strongly sheared at the base? Um, how would that affect their coherence as they, as they go? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm aware of, you know, Maria Weber, she's carrying out these kind of uh, rising flux tube simulation in uh, um, late type stars, fully convective stars. Yeah, sim but haven't done any doing that. Speaker is Nick Featherstone. Uh, we have the worked at 8.30 this morning, but you always wonder if it's going <laughs> to transition over or not. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I'm Nick Featherstone, and I'll be uh, talking a little bit about uh, what I'm seeing now as kind of a connection between stellar and planetary dynamo theory, and I think a lot of folks have uh, noted this before, but it is interesting with uh, some of the recent results in the sun that uh, solar convection might be somewhat more similar to planetary convection uh, than we had thought before. Uh, this is some work uh, that draws on um, collaborations uh, with uh, Brad Hyman and Keith Julian primarily, but also some with uh, Mike Hawkins and Ryan Orvidal, John Arno, Moritz Heimpel, and uh, Mark Meesh. Uh, so why are we here, right? Um, always ask every morning when I wake up. Um, but I'm going to talk just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of uh, solar structure and convection. Uh, then I'll talk about this, this, this problem of the, the Rossby number in the sun. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about this solar planetary connection. Uh, but uh, so I realize this is not a room full of solar physicists. And so if you were to uh, you know, look at the sun, uh, the first thing you would notice is that you just hurt your eyes. Um, it's very bright. But if you were to look at it in some filtered uh, light, uh, you'll see uh, some sunspots on the surface, these little dark patches. And if you were to watch it long enough um, and really try to make yourself blind, you'll notice that they rotate. And, they, and you can actually see the rotation over the course of the day. Um, but we actually know quite a bit more about the sun than what we see at the surface uh, due to um, this technique uh, called helioseismology. And what we do is we, we look at the radial motion of the surface of the sun. Um, we decompose that into um, a wave field, and then we can look at the properties of that wave field. And we see that the sun is actually full of resonant acoustic modes. Uh, we have this stochastic excitation mechanism at the surface due to the small scale granulation that you've uh, no doubt seen. Um, this is creating sound waves that are bouncing around all through the sun, and certain of those modes are resonant. And by looking at the properties of these modes, we can determine something about the internal structure of the sun. Uh, through helioseismology, just like we would do uh, with seismology on the Earth. And uh, kind of the, the big results from the point of view of uh, those of us who model the interior dynamics of the sun 
really are probably that we, we have a good handle of the internal structure of the sun now. Um, and also we know uh, something about its internal rotation. We know that the sun rotates differentially uh, throughout the outer 30% uh, of the sun, which is the, um, the region where convection is taking place. And it has a, a period of about 24 days at the equator and about 30 days at the poles. Um, the internal structure, though, uh, I think is, is kind of useful um, to get a handle on if you're, if you're thinking about what it means to model convection in the sun or in a star. Um, and so we know through helioseismology that the, um, the sun can be divided roughly into to three different regions. Uh, we have a, a core where fusion takes place and then a, a radiative zone where the uh, energy generated by that fusion is carried out through photon scattering. And then finally, a region where that scattering becomes less efficient and the, the heat is actually deposited in the plasma and drives, um, drives convection through an internal heating, uh, radiative heating. Uh, so in the core, uh, we're actually pretty dense, about 150 grams per centimeter cubed, and almost 16 million Kelvin. Um, and then where you cut off the core is a bit arbitrary, but I believe that most of the fusion is not taking place by the time you hit 25% of the sun's radius. Um, then we have this radiative zone, um, and the temperature varies fairly substantially across there uh, from uh, about 8 million Kelvin up to the base of the convection zone, which sits around 2 million Kelvin. Um, and the convection zone is what we're what we're particularly interested in. Um, and there's actually quite a bit of variation here in the, in the thermodynamic properties. We, we go from 2 million Kelvin to about 6,000 Kelvin at the, at the photosphere. Uh, the density uh, drops by six orders of magnitude across, across this region. Um, and we have convection going on here. Uh, and we're not quite sure of the convective time scale, which is uh, part of the point of this, this talk. Um, one of the interesting things is that everything we see, all the, all the beautiful images that we see of the sun, uh, particularly the ones in the photosphere itself, not the chromosphere, the corona, um, this, this small scale uh, stuff you see here, this is surface convection, this is a solar granulation, and it's sort of surrounding this giant sunspot here, which is about the size of the, the Earth, which is shown there for scale. Um, but all of this, this, this stuff that we can see with our telescopes, uh, this occupies a region that's actually thinner than the width of the line used to draw the the circle here. Um, and even across that region, the temperature varies quite substantially. Right? It increases by 10,000 Kelvin, and the density varies by, by an order of magnitude. But uh, for the bulk of the convection zone, it really is a region of extreme contrast. And if you try to assign some non-dimensional numbers to, uh, to the system, they're, they're quite, uh, quite large. Um, we, we have a, a substantial density stratification across this region. So uh, something like 11 density scale heights to go from the the base of the convection zone up to, uh, I believe it was 0.99 R sun I used. Um, pressure similarly varies. Uh, if you try to assign a Reynolds number uh, to this, you get something between 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 14. Um, Rayleigh number, 10 to the 22 to 10 to the 24. Uh, the magnetic Prandtl number is small. The actual Prandtl number is quite small, 10 to the minus 7. Uh, and then an Ekman number of about 10 to the minus 15. Uh, so these are some pretty extreme non-dimensional numbers that you have to cope with if you're trying to do any kind of modeling to, to say something uh, about the interior of the sun or of a star, um, or um, if you're trying to actually understand something. So I, I would say uh, one of the big questions right now in, in solar convection and solar dynamo theory is, uh, what is the Rossby number uh, that characterizes the, the solar convection zone? Um, and you can define Rossby numbers in different ways, but uh, whenever I use the Rossby number in this talk, with the exception of one helioseismology result that I'll show, um, I'm talking about a system scale Rossby number. Okay, um, so I use the the depth of the convective layer, and I take some kind of RMS measurement of the of the flow. And so uh, with the sun, if I'm asking what the Rossby number is, what I'm really saying is, well, what is what is v, right? Um, and it turns out that this is probably important for for the dynamo. Um, we know that the sun cycles with this um, <coughs> pretty regular period of about 22 years, some variation about that. Um, we know that there's, there's quite a bit of ordering in terms of how the flux emerges. It emerges at high latitudes over, and then uh, gradually emerges at lower and lower latitudes over the course of the cycle. Um, the, the sunspots that we see obey certain polarity rules. Um, sunspot pairs obey uh, certain uh, rules related regarding their, their tilt, as uh, Yu Hong was talking about. Um, and all of this is taking place uh, in, a, in a region that is characterized by uh, rotation and, uh, uh, and a big uh, 
mass of convecting plasma. And so the Rossby number is, is probably important. And you can see that indirectly if you just look at any results uh, from really any, any models, whether they're, they're hydrodynamic or they're uh, MHD. Uh, for instance, the Rossby number uh, in, impacts the, the nature of the differential rotation you get. Uh, so if you're at a, a low Rossby number, you tend to drive a, a solar-like differential rotation. So here we're just showing um, the uh, omega minus the, uh, the frame rate. And we get a prograde equator with retrograde polar regions. Um, as you transition to a higher Rossby number, so faster flows or slower rotation rate, um, the, the nature of the, the differential rotation flips. And we reach one of these, these states that we call anti-solar differential rotation. And, uh, a number of people have looked at this. I looked at this some with Mark Meesh, who were thinking about the meridional circulation. Uh, but this has been looked at um, at least uh, as long ago as 1982, beginning with uh, Gary Gladsmeyer and Peter Gilman. Uh, Tomas Gastine has really done some, some excellent work um, characterizing this transition systematically. Um, Say, so, OK, uh, what about the magnetism? Uh, one of the kind of big results of the last decade was this a result by uh, Gizarro, Charbonneau, and Shmolkevich, uh, where they, they achieved cycles, uh, regular cycles, in a, in a solar dynamo model. Um, and that, that, that occurred at a Rossby number of about 10 to the minus 2 uh, scale RMS velocity kind of Rossby number. Uh, there was uh, some later work done by Petri Capula, um, where they found equatorial propagation of their magnetic uh, features in their dynamo in addition to, to cycling. Uh, Rossby number again of about 10 to the minus 2. Large scale coherent magnetic structures uh, were found by uh, Ben Brown and then uh, also uh, later on by uh, Nick Nelson, who, who found that these things could uh, become magnetically buoyant and rise. Uh, and this occurs again at a fairly low Rossby number, uh, close to 10 to the minus 2. So you might ask, okay, well, these are models. What, what is the Rossby number in the sun? Um, and the answer is that we don't really know. Um, and there's some contention over what we do know. Uh, so if you were to say, I want to create a map of flow fields inside of the sun uh, using helioseismology, uh, if you want to directly image the flows, you can basically go down through the near surface shear layer, uh, which is about 30 megameters in depth. So that's about 15% of the convection zone depth. Um, below that, uh, really just the, the averaging uh, kernels that are, uh, or the, the sensitivity kernels and the averaging kernels you can build with those um, based on the, the mode set you have available aren't sufficient to get a, a good measurement down there. Um, there was a, a very interesting result a few years ago uh, by uh, Siobhan Hanasoge and collaborators uh, which looked for um, signals of convection at depth and they were not able to find any. And so uh, what they, they actually had was a, was a non-detection, uh, but it placed a pretty uh, substantial upper bounds on the convective flow speeds in the sun. Um, in regions where this technique and the one here, uh, which is uh, an effort led by uh, Ben Greer, a former grad student at CU, um, are able to overlap, the, the measurements actually disagree. Um, so I would say this is, this is really an open question. Uh, what is uh, the typical convective flow speed in the sun, uh, particularly at depth um, below the, the near surface shear layer. And this has implications beyond just the sun, because the sun is our you know, sort of standard point of reference when we're asking about the, the properties of other stars. Right? We use the sun um, as a calibration point in a lot of different ways. Um, and so when we want to ask ourselves, well, what, what is a, a typical convective flow or a typical Rossby number for another star, we're probably indirectly drawing on some kind of calibration that was done against the sun. Uh, just as kind of a, an example of this, uh, you may have heard of this interesting rotation activity correlation. Um, what you're seeing here on the, the y-axis is a, a measure of x-ray flux. Um, and this is uh, measured for uh, samples of different types of stars. We've got F, K, G, and M here, so different low mass stars. And it's plotted versus uh, the rotation period of the star. And what you see is that as rotation period decreases, so as the stars in your sample spin up, uh, the X-ray flux, which is uh, an indirect indicator of uh, magnetic activity, uh, scales uh, up and increases as the rotation period decreases. Right? Um, but eventually, this, this, this saturates. Um, and it's not quite understood why this saturates, whether this has something to do with the interior dynamo or this is some sort of a surface uh, field kind of effect. Um, but we're asking 
if we're trying to convert this to a Rossby number and say something about the, the actual interior dynamo of these stars that are on this plot, um, it would help to know, you know where the sun is. Right? Um, kind of another thing people are thinking about, a pretty hot topic right now, is uh, you know, we find all of these exoplanets around M stars. Uh, these stars are known uh, to, to be fairly magnetically active. We don't quite understand their interior dynamos um, either, and so there's, there's implications there, though a bit, maybe a bit tenuous because we can measure the magnetic activity on these stars. Uh, but if we're trying to understand something about the habitable region around low mass stars that we're detecting planets around, um, it, and we want to know, we want to say something about the dynamos of those stars, we need to know about their Rossby number too. So what is it about rotation that is, is really uh, so important? And uh, it does various things, but probably the order one effect is that if you have rotating convection, uh, you get these, these boosy columns, or uh, sometimes in the, the solar stellar area, we like to call them banana cells. Um, and <clears throat> what these are, these are just big columnar convection rolls, and they're, they're basically the most unstable mode. So when you're, when you're just barely critical, this is the first thing you see. Uh, but as you become more and more supercritical, you still maintain some manifestation of these things. Um, the interesting thing about these is that the, the preferred longitudinal wave number uh, scales as Ekman to the minus one third. So as you move to lower and lower Ekman numbers, so uh, more rapid rotation, lower viscosity, uh, the, the spatial scale of these things uh, decreases. Uh, just kind of as an illustration of that, I've got some results from some models here. These are <coughs> depicting radial velocity near the upper boundary in a series of uh, solar motivated convection simulations. Uh, red shows upflows, blue shows downflows, and these are all um, carried out at a flux Rayleigh number of about 10 to the 6. And so I've got the ECMA number labeled here, and you can see the, the non rotating reference. And then uh, we move from high ECMA numbers and gradually decrease the ECMA number. And as we lower the ECMA number, um, we see that the uh, columnar structures, uh, this particular model is operating at a, a high ECMA number and also a high Rossby number. And so you're actually getting an anti solar sort of differential rotation here. And if you look, you notice the, the features tend to drift a little bit to the left, uh, but not in a very organized fashion. Uh, but as we lower the ECMA number a little more, we start to see uh, some hint of these, these columnar convection rolls. Uh, they tend to drive a prograde differential rotation, which you can see at the equator there. And as we continue to lower the ECMA number, and I'm keeping the Rayleigh number fixed, and so I'm also decreasing the supercriticality as I go across this plot. Um, <clears throat> but the, the rolls become thinner, uh, much more prominent at the equator, and finally uh, the rolls are very thin, and we've, we've sort of killed off the columnar convection. So this probably um, isn't that interesting for the sun because the sun is uh, fairly supercritical, but it, it illustrates nicely what, what occurs as you, as you lower the ECMA number. Um, and I, I apologize, I, I couldn't dig up the ECMA number for this this morning. This is just another model. Um, this one's run by Moritz uh, Heimpel. He was looking at convection in Jupiter's atmosphere. And what you're seeing here is the uh, radial component of the vorticity. And so, this is run at a very low ECMA number, and he's got many, many of these little columnar um, cells. Uh, there's been a little bit of volume rendering done here, which is why you see things kind of, kind of pop up. Um, but uh, so these rolls, they can, they can sort of appear in, in different ways. Uh, the, the time here is in rotation period. So this, this thing is a fairly uh, rapidly rotating system relative to the, to the convective time scales. You know, just another illustration of these rolls. Uh, so what happens, though, is that these rolls, right, they, they impact the, the spherical boundary at some point. Um, you have this, this sort of balance between pressure and Coriolis forces within these rolls, um, and that has to, to change as they approach this curved boundary. And so you tend to drive these helical uh, flow or axial flows along the rolls, which gives you this, this nice helical uh, sense of the motion. Right? And so uh, here's this, this nice illustration by Peter Olson. Uh, but it just sort of shows how if you thread these things with a magnetic field, uh, you can go from toroidal field to poloidal field and poloidal field to toroidal field. Right? So when we, we ask ourselves, you know, what is the, the convective amplitude in the sun uh, or other stars, or what is the Rossby number, um, the reason we care is because of this structure which is central to the generation of magnetic field um, in a dynamo. But it's very challenging to model. Um, if we were to ask ourselves what are some 
uh, typical non-dimensional parameters. Um, it's not just that the sun is typ difficult, but the, so, is the, uh, so is the planetary interior, right? Um, ECMA number for the sun is about 10 to the minus 15, and ECMA number for the interior of the Earth is also about 10 to the minus 15. And that becomes very different to model. Um, and the reason is that the scales that we become interested in uh, become vanishingly small very quickly. Um, this just shows, this is a, a nice uh, illustration by, by John Arnaud, it shows kind of the columnar size you would expect for an ECMA number of 10 to the minus 4. You can see it. You could model this. You could resolve this in a model without any problem. Um, sorry. But if we go to Ekman 10 to the minus 9, uh, the, the, the spatial scale of the column becomes just a few pixels on the screen here. And if we go to the Ekman number of interest, you can't even plot it on the PowerPoint anymore. Okay? Which, you know, if you can't plot it on a PowerPoint, what good is it? <laughs> um, Right, so this is the challenge, right? For stars and planets, the ECMA number is very small, uh, and the Reynolds number is very high. And so everything we care about is very small, but the things that we observe and also care about are very big. Um, so what do you do with that? So the question, I think, is really how do we make useful use out of models? We can always model things. You can model anything you want, simulate anything you want. Um, but it's, it's tough to do anything useful, um, or at least anything that doesn't make you feel stupid at the end of the day if you think about what you've done, right? Um, and so I would say uh, kind of the, the few things we can do are uh, we should you know, model regimes of convection where uh, we can actually quantifiably state that the, the influence of diffusion on the model is negligible on you know, some scale. Uh, we can try to indirectly compare against observables, and I'll show some examples of points one and two in a minute. Um, and then this seems a little odd for, I think, stellar convection research. Uh, but planetary folks do this all the time. You know, you, you can compare to laboratory results. And I don't think the sun is that special. Um, and I think there are some interesting um, things you can do in the laboratory now, which I'll, I'll sort of show on one of my last slides, uh, which might make for some interesting inner comparisons. It's really quick if we're modeling stellar convection. What does that even mean if you're kind of a standard convection person? Well, Start with the standard hot plate, cold plate, Rayleigh-Bernard setup. Convert the bottom plate to an insulator and add internal heating. Interestingly enough, uh, you can do that in the lab. There's this experiment I read about several years ago by this, uh, these guys, Kalaki and Goldstein. And they, they filled this little container with an electrolytic solution, and then they just passed an alternating current through it. So they just electrocuted their solution until it heated up. Um, then you, you convert it to spherical geometry, right? So we've got this internal heating, this insulating core, and then some cold plate at the top where the, the flux passes out through conduction. Uh, not the best approximation to what's going on in the actual sum, but if you want to tackle things on the large scales, that's pretty much what you have to do. Uh, interestingly enough, if you have a space shuttle handy, you can, you can run an, an experiment like that as well. So um, some progress can be made in the lab, uh, but these other effects, particularly density variation, to uh, have to look at those in the lab. Um, I'm going to show a few model results. These are done with the, the Rayleigh code. Uh, if you're interested in a spherical convection code that's open source, just ask me about that. Um, this is not terribly important for what I'm talking about here, but it is a, uh, it's a pseudo-spectral model. So we use spherical harmonics in the horizontal, Chebyshev modes in the, in the radial direction, and we use a semi-implicit explicit time skipping, stepping scheme and it's analastic in HD. Um, so just to give you a sense of where you can get to with models, though, um, these are some non-rotating models uh, that I ran with Brad Hyman a few years ago. And we looked at how the, the non-dimensional measure of the kinetic energy scales with a flux Rayleigh number in the system. Um, and we found that uh, pretty early on, once you had a flux Rayleigh number of around uh, a million or so, uh, you latch on to this asymptotic scaling regime which is very close to kinetic energy scaling like Rayleigh number to the two-thirds, uh, flux Rayleigh number, I should say. And this is telling you that you, you've achieved a free-fall scaling, which says that to leading order, um, diffusion is not important for the global scale dynamics of the system. And the primary balance that you get is between uh, buoyancy and inertia in the, in the momentum equations. You could uh, ask what, what can you do usefully with rotation. Um, but one thing I'll mention here, sorry, I should say, is that if you're trying to study a star or the interior of a planet where um, diffusive effects are, are minimal, you know they're going to be too high in your models. But it's always good to be able to quantify somehow the, 
the actual importance of those those effects. And so you want to be operating out here uh, with your, your modeling and not, not down here. Uh, rotation changes things, right, because we tend to build these, these columnar structures. Uh, this is <coughs> just an example of a non-rotating model and a rotating model, and I've plotted their spectrum as a function of the kinetic energy spectrum as a function of spherical harmonic degree, uh, L, uh, near, the, near the upper boundary. Uh, the main thing here is that if you subtract out the, the mean flows, uh, you see that the uh, convective flows, which are blue for the non-rotating model and red for the rotating model, um, show a very different shape to their, their structure. And this is because of the, the appearance of these uh, busa columns or banana cells. And this, so it causes the spectrum to peak at a, at a much higher wave number than it does in the non-rotating case. You can actually ask yourself how this peak varies with Rossby numbers. So we can uh, plot models. So we've got a non-rotating model at Rossby infinity. Um, and then we've got models, three different models at three different Rossby numbers here. And you can see the the peak move. The green one is an anti-solar model, so it barely knows about rotation. Uh, and then the blue and the red models here are rotationally constrained. Um, if you do something like that, <coughs> you can see um, what I'm showing here are I'm plotting the position of the peak as a function of inverse Rossby number. These blue uh, data points are, are essentially non-rotating. They're, they're anti-solar, uh, so their the Rossby numbers are very high. But as you move to lower Rossby numbers, you also latch on to a, a scaling regime here, uh, which gives you um, uh, a Rossby to the minus 1 half scaling. And it tells you that your primary balance is now between Coriolis inertia and buoyancy, and that diffusion is playing. It still plays a role, but it's not playing a leading order role in the dynamics. Uh, and then I use this to make some arguments about um, what you can say something about supergranulation and say, you know, is it possible that these, these big columnar structures in the sun, the reason we don't see giant cells on the surface of the sun is because these things are smaller than supergranulation. So um, this is sort of an indirect comparison that you can say, OK, what L peak would give me the size of supergranulation? And that gives you uh, one possible upper bound on the, on the velocity. Um, but it's just an upper bound, and there's some hand waving there. Um, but I just. So you know, where, where do we go from here? Uh, and we can always incorporate more things. We're very good about that in uh, solar and stellar astrophysics, right? We just throw in more, more physically realistic effects. Um, but I think what we should start doing, possibly in the, in the stellar realm, is really thinking more about Earth-like regimes and the, the force balances that arise there. Um, because it does seem that, for the sun at least, uh, we're, in a, we're operating in a low Rossby number regime. Certainly there are stars that we consider to be rapid rotators, which are rotating much more rapidly than the sun but they may have a very similar mass. And so those are absolutely operating in, in some very low Rossby number regime. Um, and we might also compare a little bit with laboratory data. So what I'll just show, uh, a little bit of um, some work from Mike Calkins here to give a sense of what kind of, of, of balances you might get uh, in an Earth-like regime. So this is a, a model that's, that's just barely critical. Um, and he's run it at an equi number of 10 to the minus 5. Uh, but the, uh, the important thing here is that if he he picked a single point in the domain and plotted the uh, pressure and Coriolis forces as a function of time. Right? And we can see that uh, at leading order, this is, this is the balance that's struck. Uh, you, get, you obtain a geostrophic balance, uh, which is pretty common in Earth-like dynamo models. Um, but then you can say, OK, what happens if we, we add these together and look at the residuals? And then you find that, um, so notice here, the scale on the axis is 10 to the 7. Um, then we, we go down two orders of magnitude, and we see, OK, we've got a balance between Coriolis pressure and buoyancy. Um, and then the dynamics occurs at a much lower amplitude here. Um, and so it, it may be worth thinking about um, this sort of balance in the context of the sun and stars. It's not clear that they're any more special, um, that there's anything special about them relative to planets, say. So we, we might look for different regimes of, of convection and ask what's happening there. This just shows uh, some work uh, from um, Rubio, uh, Keith Gillian, John Weiss, and Edgar Gnoblock, uh, where they were looking at uh, convection in a, in a the rapidly rotating limit. Um, and they find that they can have you know, very high Reynolds number flow with very small scale features. You're seeing the, the temperature anomaly here, I believe, uh, sort of red is, uh, is this temperature or is this vorticity? It is temperature. OK. Um, can't get it to restart. Um, so what happens is you have these very small scale uh, filamentary flow structures, and they, they coalesce into much larger uh, 
small scale structures. And so it would be interesting to look at this in spherical geometry, ask how this interacts with density stratification um, in the context of a star. Uh, the last thing I'll just mention, um, if you want to compare with the laboratory, uh, there's this very interesting paper that was uh, published just this summer. Um, but there's, there's a, a nice internal heating experiment uh, done out of, out of, with, by a group out at CEA uh, in France. And what they've done is they've basically taken a lighthouse light and they shine it into this tank of fluid. And in that fluid, they dissolve ink with uh, different uh, concentrations. And by controlling the concentration of, of the ink that they're dissolving in the fluid, um, they create a layer of fluid that absorbs the light. And so the fluid is heated internally instead of through the boundary. Um, and uh, so you get some very interesting results out of this with regard to the efficiency of the, the heat transport. Uh, but I think that if we're, we're thinking of stars and even some planets, uh, Jupiter, for instance, uh, is probably internally modeled better by internal heating than, than boundary heating. Um, this is the, the sort of thing we would want to, to look at in the laboratory and say, what, what can we, how can we work together with, with models uh, and, with, and with laboratory experiments, you know, particularly if we rotate this thing. I'm sure there'll be something interesting to come out of that. I'm sure they're, they're probably working on that now. Um, Last thing I'll say, uh, two things. Uh, if you are interested in the Rayleigh code, we're running, you know, Eric Hell, I believe, advertised this to everyone. We're running a tutorial uh, on Saturday on CU's campus in the Engineering Center. Uh, so it'll teach you to build the code, how to get output, how to plot, all this kind of thing. Uh, so if you're interested in that and you haven't signed up, just see me. Uh, we still have uh, plenty of space. I think online it's limited to 20, but the room holds like 70 to 100 people. Um, also, I was just going to say, uh, Keith and Brad and I are attempting to hire a postdoc. So if you know of any good candidates who want to work on modeling rotating convection, um, let us know. And I'll stop there. But uh, thank you. Oh, Lauren. Hi. Uh, so thank you for a nice talk and also for bringing Boosie Columns kind of explicitly into the fray. Um, and related to Boosie Columns, I guess I was wondering, we know that the Rossby number has to be um, low, like rotationally constrained for Boosie Columns to exist. But I guess which Rossby number is, or, or which flow components are most important in that Rossby number, like the horizontal flow components, vertical flow components, um, or does it not matter? I mean, the standard definition is just the full convective velocity, but I guess is that really the best definition so for? That, you know, that's probably a better question for Tamar Gassim because he found a definition that gave him a the clear transition at Rossby of 1. Um, <laughs> what, what I would say is, is the, the actual definition probably doesn't matter, but it, it's, you know, if you look at the, uh, use the convective amplitude, not the differential rotation, to define your Rossby number, um, and then you'll get a clear break at some value that's, you know, between 1 and 0 0.1, depending on how you, how you define it. So, um, in one of the slides, you uh, you had um, just p numbers low, mid, and high, and you had the differential rotation simulation. Um, there, um, you seem to produce uh, solar-like for low, on, but um, the thing uh, is that it's very asymmetric about the equator. The north sum north south asymmetry is very prominent, so. Um, that so is inconsistent with observation. Are you? No, uh, the low one. The, the, the low one? Yeah. So the, the asymmetry? Not south asymmetry, near particularly the high latitude regions. So could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, so the first thing is that in any of these plots that anyone shows, when you see the poles, um, the, the averaging there is done. So these things are averaged in time and in space. Uh, so we average azimuthally. Um, and so the first thing is that when you, when you see the, the polar regions, um, that is where there is the least volume of the model that has been averaged over. And so the, the averaging is inherently worse here than it is down here. Um, but uh, so that, that was one part of the asymmetry. But then you mentioned another, 
or is that is that it? Yeah, yeah. I would just sometimes some of us just chop the poles off when we show these so that we don't have to um, get get into this. But uh, yeah, that's 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 all that is usually. Now, you, know, you can get you can get little polar vortices that are persistent though over time, um, and they're they're sort of transient but on long time scales. So if I were to run this average over another uh, time period, I might see something at the South Pole and not at the not at the North Pole. working? Yeah, it is. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about understanding vertical shear instability uh, in proliferatory accretion disk as a symmetric slantwise convection. This is the work uh, kind of a uh, side project of my PhD, and I'm doing it with the Al Hefetz and the Orkan Umrahan. Okay, so a little bit of outline. I'll throw this aside so it won't bother us too much. It's, I'll talk about a little bit what was done with the VSI uh, vertical fissure instability and what people have done so far. I'll talk about the atmospheric symmetric instability and the GSFI, which is the Goldreich Schubert Frickel instability. Uh, afterwards, after the introduction, a little bit about the mechanism of the VSI, and we'll split it into two about the instability itself and the uh, oscillation propagation. And at the end, VSI and disks, which it's actually work in progress, and I wasn't able to uh, finish it till this lecture. Okay, so two minutes about the angular momentum problem that people talked about here in the first uh, in the first session in the first uh, lecture. So there's this question about what is the origin of the disk turbulence? Uh, molecular viscosity obviously is not strong enough in order to dissipate the angular momentum or to re reorganize it. So there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion about what is the important processes of turbulence in the disk. And basically there's a people talk about is it the magnetorotational instability or is the disk not ionized enough? This it's, it's a different question. We won't go into it. But basically you have two type of uh, instability. One involves only gas, and you have here kind of the general setup, and the vertical shear instability is here. It's a linear instability. And also you have later turbulence, which uh, usually has also solid, not only gas in it, and uh, those are usually later time instabilities, but 
again, we won't talk about it too much. So, uh, can we switch to that one, actually, to this mic, I rather? Okay, so, you me? Yeah, just put it a little bit higher. Okay, so this is the full equation of the uh, disk of the VSL. I'll talk a little bit about the setup, and then I'll show what simulation has shown. Uh, so I won't go over this too much, but basically we have here the equation, which is the momentum second. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So we have here the uh, momentum equation, the continuity equation, and of course an equation for the energy with the sinks and sorts. And the general setup is we have this type of uh, mid plane temperature and density, the usual type of uh, parameters and P and Q, and we're using the ideal gas. Now, usually people talk about either is is a thermic or a polytropic disk and these are the equation for that and we're of course in the small shearing box approximation which is a kind of the, this box inside this uh, disk and we go in mapping to x y and z so uh, sorry i didn't write the from where i took this but i think it's from uh, it's from clay and uh, stall and basically what we see here is the velocity a field in the R and the theta component, and we see this kind of slantwise thing that this is uh, what we'll talk about. And here's another another uh, picture of the velocity field, this time in the R and vertical um, co coordinates, and still again you see this kind of motion which is going like one up, one down, and it's easy to see here. And again, the vertical velocity, which is doing the same thing, and is going like up and down and oscillating. So usually that was the full uh, equation. And what people have done, uh, they have shown that this can be actually reproduced in a reduced system set. And basically, these are the equation. It's the equation already for the perturbation. I forgot to say before that uh, basic state is talking about a both hydrostatic and geostrophic uh, balance. And what we have here in the equation is basically what we are saying is that the perturbation is geostrophic. That's equation eight. We have this kind of V equation and this uh, vertical velocity and, um, and the continuity equation. So before I go into what's going on with the reduced equation, Basically, what I, want, what I want to show is this kind of uh, mechanism is robust, and you can see it all over the place in different geometries and different places. One is in the atmosphere, when you have kind of the same equation. B is the buoyancy, but, this, but they actually this reduced equation is also geostrophic and hydrostatic. Um, and this is the perturbation equation. It's a small difference difference here is that we have the equation 15 that says that instead of the perturbation being geostrophic, it's actually, uh, it's not geostrophic, but it is hydrostatic. And the idea about this well-known instability in the atmosphere, which is basically what defines the term slantwise convection, is that you can, parcel can be actually stable in both, in both coordinates, in the vertical coordinates and some kind of other coordinate like R. But if you take some kind of slantwise trajectory, you can actually con be unstable and continue to be your mo you're not being, a, you're basically continuing with your motion. So that's the main idea of slantwise convection. And this is not an instability, it's just how the instability kind of manifests itself 
it goes in a slantwise direction, when we can, and we can see this a lot. So first of all, the most robust place we see this is in the atmosphere, that we have this line towards convection, and uh, we're having clouds. Be, and this is actually moist, but we have clouds that get this shape because the acceleration is actually slantwise. We also have, and we won't obviously won't go over this equation, we have the uh, Goldreich-Schubert Frickel instability, which at the end of the day, we'll see this later, this equation, when we talk about our reduced equations of the VSI. But basically, you get this, the same criteria that we'll get at, that we'll get in a, a few slides, which means, which says this uh, same thing, that if you're in some kind of angle that is between the, actually the, ang the momentum, the angular momentum, and in, this, in the case of the atmosphere, the isotropes, and if you stay between them, you can actually, prop you can actually go un unstable and this is the same thing that you have in this instability. And this is kind of a different uh, stability criterion, but it, at the end of the day, I'll show that these all Solberg, uh, Holberg, I forgot the name, all the instability that have look kind of the diff different actually end up at, uh, at the same explanation, which is you need to be in a higher angle, which actually what it means, higher angle than some critical angle, and we'll see in a second, and what it means is you can basically rob the vertical shear in order to, uh, in order to like uh, be stronger than the Coriolis returning effect. Okay, so what I know of, of, the, of the explanation of the VSI, we're going back to the vertical shear instability, is this parcel method, which means that if you chain, you look at two parcels and calculate their energy, you end up with negative energy, and then you have energy for instability. That's the usual kind of a heuristic, uh, heuristic explanation. So what we're doing now, we're going, all of that was kind of an introduction to what is the VSI slantwise and how you can find it in other places and it, it's robust. But now what we did is basically split the uh, mechanism. We wanted to look at the mechanism in order to understand a little bit better what's going on and how the, the velocity trajectory looks like. So we kind of go gradually from, we'll call it unreal setups to more real setups to, un to reveal the different terms. So in order to understand the instability itself, that I was talking about it. So again, we're using this reduced equation, and this is the dispersion relation, and if you put inside like this regular form, you end up with, with this uh, dispersion relation. And again, here you see the first time, and we're not the first one that actually showed this, it was shown by Ladder and Papaloizo uh, a year ago, is that if, if you, You'll get instability, of course, if alpha is larger than the critical alpha. And the critical alpha is defined by Cy over S, S0, which is basically the rotation at the location uh, over this uh, um, vertical shear. In this case, because we're looking, uh, so I forgot to say, now we're looking at a really non-realistic case, which the shear and, uh, and the density is constant. So this probably doesn't happen anywhere, but this is, enough, this is enough to trigger just the instability and isolate it. So as we said, this slope, uh, which is the critical, uh, which is basically what defines the slope in which you can overcome the Coriolis uh, term, is actually the same as looking at the slope of the uh, mean as in little absolute momentum surface, and if you just, I won't go over the calculation, but if you just put in what is the absolute, what is the absolute momentum, and uh, you just go through the math, you can actually see that if you're looking at some kind of slope that doesn't change, this means that you have to be in this, a, in this critical slope. And if you want to go to advect, you need to go a little bit higher. 
So this is a picture that actually shows these two terms, these two kind of uh, uh, explanations together. Sorry about that. And you can see here in the uh, in this thing there, this is a stable area and this is an unstable area. And if you, this is our our parcel a uh, uh, absolute angular momentum. So one can go to the unstable regime either by this what we call the velocity, uh, the angle that is created by the velocity, which is greater than the critical alpha, or you're just in the direction of affecting angular momentum. Okay, and uh, now we wanted to look a little bit about the amplification mechanism, just to kind of draw the fields and understand how one velocity can generate another velocity or look at it in vorticity because we just like vorticity and how one vorticity from one coordinate can basically uh, create, uh, generate vorticity in a different, uh, in a different uh, coordinate and how these things are kind of positive, have a positive feedback on each other. So you just go through the calculation and you can see how, how the uh, W, which is the vertical uh, velocity, creates V and how V creates W. And of course, you have the continuity equation in order for the third uh, velocity. Or just how when you're looking the same in, on the, the definition of vorticity, how, and this is actually kind of obvious, which is nice to me, that you do a lot of stuff and you get an obvious result, is how one vorticity uh, uh, component can generate a different vorticity component. And this is just plotting to the field in order to really understand what's going on. So I'm going through the different, actually, the different um, terms in this reduced equation. Sorry for this. So it's here, sorry. So we're going for the different terms, and we'll see how one uh, velocity can generate a different, uh, different velocity component. And we're here, and one is geostrophy. Of course, we said that this is geostrophy, so we have what is called the thumb rules that if so if uh, that the low pressure is always to your left basically if you're a geostrophy so if you have this kind of motion you get like the negative pressure on this side and the positive pressure on this side the same with this component of the velocity and you end up creating either the vertical velocity or if you want to look at it at, at uh, vorticity or creating this uh, the z, the y actually, the y component of vorticity. The same thing with the Coriolis effect. If you have Coriolis, so you're get, you're being kind of uh, pushed to the right. So again, you can create one type of vorticity from the other type of vorticity. And the last thing that is special here is the shear is the shear advection. That basically you can create again vorticity by advecting shear. And these. Uh, uh, graphs I'll show here are actually the same ones, the same terms we just saw, but inside the setup of the, the setup with the critical angular momentum. And basically, one can see that if you have the right setup, you can uh, you can end up unstable. So again, it's not it's the same thing as we just saw. This is how the geostrophy term looks. This is how the Coriolis term looks. And the shared vection, and basically, this is the classic image you'll see in any textbooks in, on atmospheric uh, dynamics on this slantwise convection. Is basically that if if the setup is just right, uh, you'll get the instability, which is basically the same thing as saying all the things we said before about the critical angle, the parcel method, or the or the angular momentum convection. And just to finish this whole, how can we look at the instability in a few different ways? So we also talk about the solberg -Hol holland rayleigh like type condition, which is the negative energy, which basically says, as we said before, that if, the, if you have a growing angular momentum in the disk and you have no shear in the vertical, in the vertical uh, direction, the disk will be stable. But of course, here we have some kind of shear, so the shear kind of helps us uh, overcoming Coriolis. And just to go through the calculations, you just put in 
what the, the different uh, velocities, and you end up again with this type of criterion, which says again that if alpha is greater than alpha c, this whole Solomberg Holland Rayleigh type condition goes back to that you need to be in this critical um, velocity setup. And of course, this uh, condition only type talks about the the mutual velocity. It doesn't talk about all the uh, velocities. So just for completeness, uh, we define the xi as a over a critical alpha over a critical, and put in all the cx as diff as they are, and non-dimensionize this to see how the growth rate and the structure looks like. So basically, it looks like this, and one can see that. The maximum growth rate is wh is when the critical, when the slope is two times the critical slope, and this is just the structure. And in ver the, the vorticity, you can see that in the maximum rate, the uh, this component of vorticity is much larger than the uh, x one. Okay, so. Ten minutes left. Okay, <laughs> thanks. I'll be finished before, and we can all go eat. Uh, so the uh, oscillation. So a little bit about the oscillation. In order to get the oscillation, you need to, I'll call it, advance a little bit about with the setup. And now we're, you can't get the oscillation when you just have the uh, uh, density and um, and vertical shear being constant, so you need to change this a bit. So in this, what we did, and this is, looks like an atmosphere, basically. Uh, we have uh, the, sorry about that. We have rho being the basic state rho looking something like that, and this change a little bit the equation, not too much. You have this kind of continuity equation uh, because of this drop, and you have the, this dispersion relation, and now instead of adding the, uh, Putting in the solution from uh, the form we saw last time, we just add this. It's kind of the same, and define the what is now the anelastic solution as this. And we just put everything in. And the nice thing is, is you can you get kind of this template that the, for at least the anelastic one. And basically, we won't show it here, but you can see this is going to happen with any type of. Uh, pressure and uh, shear you'll put in is you have the growth rate is basically the incompressible growth rate minus something that comes from this thing. So the incompressible one is the strongest growth rate plus these other terms which are oscillations. So we wanted to look a little bit how, about this oscillation. So we kind of did a, again, we put m equals 0, which is not, a, not exactly real, but the only thing is here. It's just we wanted to see, and this term uh, is equal one. We we did all this, so the analysis will be much easier. And when you look at the, I won't go over the math because we have pictures. And basically, you put in this form, the regular form, and you look how the velocity, how one uh, velocity component can generate the other velocity component, and now you have this propagation and growth as well that we didn't, you didn't have before. And just for completing this, this is the solution. No one cares how it looks and the vorticity. And the interesting thing is now we kind of look at the velocity field and see how it propagates. Now, usually when you do this thing, the regular case, everything, every component kind of moves, let's say, but by some difference. But here it's a little bit more complicated. So the colors, it's kind of a cluster, but uh, the colors are the different terms that you saw before. I can't remember actually, but this is the vertical component, the Coriolis component, and uh, the solid is actual time. So this is the initial setup, how the how the velocity feel looks in the z x uh, surface, and this is the Coriolis and the shear the shear advection that we saw before. But this time, because we have this time kind of a phase, so we get also propagation, not only the growth, and uh, it kind of looks weird, but the uh, dashed error heads are basically how, what is the velocity and uh, which is being reproduced in t plus delta t after, after the initial velocity. And this is, the, again, the Coriolis 
and the shear advection and there and together they look something like this which is look weird now the diff now the second term is the geostrophy and again looks kind of weird but the dashed arrows are now the t plus delta t and the arrowheads with the solid the solid color is uh, the current t and uh, you can see how this uh, because of this effect you get the comp the the other component. So if you put everything together, what you can see is basically that you get this propagation at this and this thing to the left. It doesn't have to be to the left, but it depends on what initial setup you take. And what you see here, it's kind of, I think it's kind of uh, interesting because not in this case, it's not like the fields are going just, everyone's going the same amount, let's say to the left, a quadrature to the left. In this field, there, in this type of setup, they're actually switching parts. I don't have a board here, but basically, if these are the different velocities, so one goes, this goes all the way here, this goes here, and they kind of change uh, their, uh, their role. So it's kind of an interesting, and you can see, in that how you can see what is the propagation. And of course, if you put in a real proper, Proto planetary disk, it will be a little bit more difficult to see. But what we did, and I didn't manage to prepare it to this lecture, but we were using a, a one adult solution. It's a SVD type of a solution, and we can uh, already see we, what we'll show in the paper that will come up soon is that you get this. You can see the slantwise convection if you compare the slope of the momentum and the slope of the velocity and you see this thing always changing over time and while the instability is being maintained because some kind of a, a geostrophic wind and the temperature maintain it uh, you can see always that this field having this type of tilt uh, but that will be in the paper itself and uh, that's it So the papers on this subject generally describe how radiative damping can play a crucial role in making the vertical shear instability go. How does that fit into your picture? Uh, it actually doesn't. I'm just I'm just assuming that I'm in a kind of an area where I'm okay and the radiative is fast enough, so it doesn't matter. So it's not in the picture. It's it's, it's assuming it's okay. Not very experienced with the VSI. What is the angular momentum transport? Is it outward? Uh, sorry again? The transport of angular momentum of the VSI, I'm not very experienced. Is it definitely outward or inward? Yeah. Uh, outward. Uh, what I know, yeah. Outward. Okay, thank you. Lunchtime? <laughs> <laughs>